Hello, 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 YouTube world. Welcome to For Your CNA's weekly live question and answer session. Um, I'm Miss Patty, your host. And for those of you who are returning, I see we have a lot of returning people today. Hello, welcome back. For those of you who are new and don't know how this works, um, come in, make yourself at home, leave me a little uh, something in the chat to let me know that you're here. And whatever questions you have on CNA training or testing or workplace or anything else that you want to talk about today in the CNA world, uh, leave your comment in the chat and we'll get to them very shortly. So every uh, week that I come on, we're here live on Thursdays at 3 for our weekly question and answer session. Every um, week, I give a little mini lesson at the beginning while you guys are coming in and getting your questions posted, and today is no exception. So we want to, uh, we're going to jump right into today's lesson in just a few moments. Um... Let me see. So Blue's here. Hey, Blue. Um, yes, I had a great Mother's Day weekend. Thank you very, very much. I hope everybody else did too. Um, I was able to visit with my my kids and they're all grown and, and out of the house. So it was a really nice day for me to be able to connect with um, my grown kids who are living lives of their own. So we don't get together as much as I would like, but it was a wonderful, wonderful day. And of course I got to spend the day with my mom too. And that's always a special treat for me. Um, so I hope you guys all had a great Mother's Day weekend as well. Um, hi, Helen. I'm so sorry to hear that you have a headache. Uh, those are, yeah, headaches are no fun. I know I, I get headaches too from time to time. So I really hope that you're feeling better. I hope we can maybe lift your spirits a little bit anyway, but thanks for tuning in and joining. Hi, Liz, first time here. Well, welcome, welcome. So everybody else that's here, uh, if you wanna leave a hello in the chat, let me know that you're here, but let's jump into today's lesson. So today we're gonna talk about the art of active listening. Now. One of the things about active listening, and uh, we're going to talk about the test in just a few minutes, but, um, oh, hi, Tamika, and hi, Nafar, first time here, too. Well, welcome, welcome. Um, active listening is one of those things that is covered in curriculum, textbooks talk about it, and um, you know it's going to be on the test. I mean, it's kind of a, what I call a trendy or hot button issue, but it's not, it, people tend to make this really dry and boring, especially textbooks. Textbooks are the worst at making stuff dry and boring and just, you know, who cares, you know? Um, so I kind of wanted to put a little bit different spin on active listening, something a little different than what you would get in a textbook or, you know, a, um, a practice test that you're taking somewhere, right? So I'm going to kind of give you some um different viewpoints on active listening. So let's jump right in. Those of you who have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. While I'm doing the lesson, um, I won't respond to your question right away, but as soon as the lesson is over, I'll go back and look at all the questions and answer them as they come up, okay? So active listening. Um, as, cert you know, as certified nursing assistants, we play a, cr a crucial role in providing compassionate to care to patients. Now, we all know this, right? This is kind of like what we do. Um, and this is kind of what you would see in a textbook, right? So, so again, kind of dry and boring. Okay, so what? And when I read this uh, statement, that's exactly my reaction was, okay, and that, you know, that doesn't really help me, right? As a CNA, I play a crucial role in providing ca compassionate care to patients. Yeah, okay, I know that. But we have to understand that it goes way beyond physical care. And this is kind of the part that's not really talked about a whole lot. So as CNAs, we spend a lot of time learning skills. We learn how to take a pulse, count respirations, transfer a patient out of bed, ambulate a patient, turn a patient over in bed. We can do range of motion exercises. We can um, do hand care and foot care, and partial bath and peri care and catheter care. And we can empty the drainage bags. We can feed patients. I mean, we can help them with bed pants. We have all of these skills that we learn, right? And most CNA um, education is skills 
focused. You're going to read some stuff. The instructor is going to lecture on some stuff, but we tend to focus on the physical aspect of what we do because that's really kind of the hard part of the test. So that's what we tend to focus on. But that carries through to the workplace. So when you're focusing on skills in training and you focus on skills in testing, it's only natural to continue to focus on skills in the workplace. But we really have to understand that most of what we do, yes, we're doing foot care. Yes, we're doing hand care. Yes, we're transferring patients. Those are all verbs, action words, right? But when we're doing those things, a big part of what we are doing is talking with the patient. So, and this is something I say all the time, help isn't help if it's not helping, right? That, that's kind of one of my, my uh, hot button uh, sayings, help isn't help if it doesn't help. So this really, really relates to CNA world in a really big way. So when we understand that, that patient care goes beyond the physical aspects of care, like bathing, dressing, grooming, all those ADLs, vital signs, those types of things. So if it's not just physical care, if we have to work on the emotional care of the patient, the mental care of the patient as well, no one's preparing us for that part of the CNA role. Right? We're spending all of our time learning how to give a bed bath, how to help with a bed pan. We spend all of this time learning the physical aspects, and we don't spend a whole lot, lot of time focused on the emotional aspects of providing care. So when we get into those workplaces and the patient is moody or angry or grumpy or withdrawn or anything else that we might see, confused even, we don't know how to deal with it because we were trained in a, a classroom setting to do hand care. We were trained in a classroom setting to turn a patient over. We weren't really trained a whole lot in how to communicate with these patients that are experiencing major life events. And because we don't know what to do, we tend to do nothing. And we shut those patients down very, very quickly. Because if a patient tells us, hey, I'm dying and I'm really sad about that. Ah, oh, you want to talk about a conversation stopper? That is a conversation stopper because most people don't have a clue what to say. Oh, what do I say to that? I mean, what do you say to that? That's a hard one, isn't it? I'm dying, and I'm sad about that. Well, yeah, I would be sad too, absolutely. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about the um, way to respond to difficult conversations. So as CNAs, we tend to shut it down. Do you want to turn the TV on? <laughs> Do you want to go to an activity? Or we say something like, don't talk like that. Well, the patient is having very, very real feelings that absolutely need to be explored and they're running out of time to explore them. So shutting them down or completely re, um, uh, reorienting them to a different topic, that doesn't help them with what they need help with. And they're telling you what they need help with. They're giving you a statement. So we have all kinds of defense mechanisms that we put up all kinds. And um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about. And this isn't what, what textbooks tell you, right? They tell you, oh, use active listening. And we'll talk about active listening and what it is and what you can do. But they don't really give you real world scenarios. How does this really impact the patient when we're having these conversations? And that's really where I want to lead you today. I hope uh, you kind of understand where we're going with this. All right. So the way that, um, so, okay, so let me just read this to you and then we're going to discuss it. So active listening is a skill that helps us show genuine interest in what others have to say. So I'm going to give you an example and, and I'm to be very, very honest with you. This is why we're having this conversation today. Okay. So a couple of days ago, some friends of ours were over 
and they were bringing up a topic that they wanted to talk about. Now, this was a sensitive topic. It was a difficult topic. It was very emotional topic, but it was something that they wanted to have a conversation about. So they, um, you know, gave information about what was happening and their opinion of it. And um, I listened because I've been trained to listen. And I didn't just pretend to listen or listen to respond. And that's something that we all do. I'm guilty of it 100%, right? Most of us, when we're listening to somebody say something, we are formulating our response. We're not listening to what they're saying. We're listening to develop our response to what they're saying, right? So um, I was actually trying to listen to what they were saying and how it impacted them. So I was trying to do my very best active listening. And then it came time for me to talk. Now, when I wanted to give my viewpoint, um, unfortunately, this other person I was talking to did not employ any active listening techniques. Um, So as I was trying to clarify what was being said, and respond to what was being said, they were talking right over me or giving me different examples or... So in this case, this isn't a conversation any longer. This is a sermon, basically, right? So there isn't any give and take. It's not an exchange of ideas. It is not a um, conversation, two parts. It is somebody saying what they needed to say and not wanting to listen to what anybody said in relationship to that. Now, this is where I failed, okay? And I'm going to be very, very honest with you. I absolutely failed at this task because emotions got high. Now, as an instructor, as somebody who studies communication, I understand this topic forward and backward, inside and out. And my brain should have said, hold up. You know, the minute that they started interrupting me, my brain should have said, hold up. This isn't a conversation. This is them needing to talk. So my nursing brain should have kicked in and went to active listening. (laughs) But it didn't. (laughs) <laughs> and this is where I failed, right? And I'm, I'm showing you this because I'm showing you how easy it is for even when we're trained in active listening for us to go off the rails because we have things we want to say. And in a, a conversation among friends or family, that's fine. You know, you're allowed to have conversations. But when you're working with patients, it's different. We're not there to be a friend. We're not there to change their mind. We're not there to illuminate a topic. We are there to provide compassionate, emotional support. So that's where I failed. I failed to recognize that this this person needed active listening from me and not a conversation. So when we're in conversation with other people, we really, at the very beginning, have to establish in our minds what kind of conversation we're having. Is this a dialogue? Okay, two parties bouncing ideas off of one another. That's what we have with friends and family. Or is this an active listening situation where one person needs to get things off of their chest. That's what we have in a clinical situation. So two totally different types of communication here, right? So friends and family, dialogue. You can get into a heated, in-depth conversation. Patient care, not dialogue. This should be compassionate listening. And that's where this active listening comes in. Notice it doesn't say active conversation, active dialogue. It's active listening. That means that we aren't there to change the patient's mind, prove them wrong, um, show them our point of view. That's not why we're there. That, that's not what this is about. So when we have somebody who wants to have a conversation in a clinical 
um, setting, we have to very, very quickly remind our brain that we aren't there to change their minds. And this is hard to do. Like I said, I failed at this just a couple of days ago. I absolutely failed because I didn't think about my role in this conversation. I got going, right? And sometimes when we get going, we don't pay attention to who we run over in the process. So when we're, when we're dealing with patients, we need to understand that our responses our listening skills, all of the ways we relate to the patient is going to be totally different than what you would use in a friends and family situation. Two totally different conversation styles. And this is the one thing that's not covered in textbooks and videos and things like that. It's a totally different way to look at communication. So, you know, I can help my mom out of a car if she needs a little bit of help. But I'm going to help my mom a little bit different than I would help a patient down the road that I don't know, right? Physical skills, we also have to accommodate. I'm going to help friends and family a little different than I would help a stranger. Same thing with communication. I'm going to communicate with friends and family different than I would communicate with a stranger. Does that make sense? Okay, so by actively listening, we can better understand and meet the needs of those in our care. And they don't need to hear our opinion or our point of view or our take on anything. It's not going to help them a bit. That's not what we're there to do. We're there to actively listen. So what does that even mean? What is active listening? Now, all the textbooks will give you all of this information, but... I want to give you maybe a little bit different viewpoint on these five points, okay? So there's five parts to active listening. You've probably heard this before. Giving the, the talker, the speaker, your full attention. And this is harder than you think it is. We're going to get to that in a minute. Being non-judgmental. Again, harder than you think it's going to be. Showing empathy. And we show empathy the wrong way. I'm going to show you what I mean in a minute. Paraphrase and clarify is the step that is skipped most often. Now, a lot of CNAs are pretty good at the last one, asking open-ended questions, because that's kind of, that's what most instructors will focus on, is asking those open-ended questions, because that's something concrete they can teach. So instead of asking yes and no questions, you ask questions that require the patient to explain something give you more words to work with. So the last one, most people have a pretty good handle on, but let's go way up to the top. Giving your full attention. Now, in this day and age, guys, I'm going to be very honest with you. It is so hard for me to give my full attention to anyone or anything at any time. I am so all over the place. And I would imagine you guys are pretty much too, right? There's so much going on. It's just insane the amount of stuff that my brain has to pay attention to on a a minute-by-minute basis. So giving somebody your full attention, way harder than it sounds. And you probably aren't going to be able to accomplish this most of the time because call lights are going off and phones are ringing and patients are asking things and you got, I have to go get vital signs on this patient before they go to this test. And you got so much going on. And, and then you've got social media that's competing for your attention, friends and family that are competing for your attention. And all of that is buzzing around your head, right? So giving somebody your full attention is super, super hard. But if somebody is sitting there telling you, I'm dying, and that makes me really sad, they need your full attention. They don't need you to go, "Uh, yeah, that sucks, but uh, give me a minute. I got a call light to go answer. I mean, that that's just like, who would do that, right? Who would do that? Well, a lot of people do that. So giving the, the speaker your full attention is actually really, really hard to do, especially in today's society. Um, but we have to give them as much of our attention as we can in that moment, being fully present when we're having these conversations. So that's step number one. And it takes a lot of practice. Guys, I don't have it down yet. There's days that I'll sit there with my husband and he'll be talking about something and I'll realize um, I don't know what he just said. My, My brain was somewhere else, somewhere else. So being fully present when somebody's having a conversation 
takes a little bit of practice. You're not going to get it right all the time, but you need to be aware of it so you can work on it. Now, being non-judgmental, this is the big one. This is the really big one because we all have our own value systems and beliefs and thought processes and the way that we would like to see the, the world work, right? Um, so I saw a comment today. Now, this has nothing to do with healthcare. I was just scrolling through Facebook and I saw a comment um, and Ironically, it was about, um, it was a, a picture that Drew Barrymore posted reading a book and, and somebody made a comment that um, they used to like, uh, you know, the, this um, uh, celebrity because she marched to the beat of her own drum, but she uh, now has, um, I guess, uh, has values that this person doesn't agree with. And that just kind of hit me kind of funny. Well, wait a minute. You liked her because she marched to the beat of her own drum as long as it was the same tune you were carrying, right? And we do that all the time. We, we are just as guilty of that, right? We like somebody until we realize that they don't espouse all of our values. If there's any differences, if they believe in something I don't believe in, then um, maybe it's time to, uh, you know, end this friendship or... Uh, not pursue this relationship or whatever. And it, it's just not everybody is going to be like us. In fact, there is nobody on this earth exactly like me. And thank God for that. Um, I don't think the world could handle two of me, right? There's nobody on this planet that's exactly like you. And thank God for that too, because that's what makes you so special and so unique and such a treasure to those that love you because you are completely you. And we like that about ourselves, that we are unique and special and treasured, right? And we like that until we see somebody that is not like us. And instead of recognizing that they are unique and special and treasured, we want to attack them for the differences that they have from us. And if we do that, what we're doing is trying to make ourselves less unique. And then we would be less special and less treasured. So when we're having these conversations, it's really easy to slip into being judgmental. But when you find yourselves disagreeing with somebody else's stance, instead of recognizing that that's what makes them unique and honoring their uniqueness and saying that's an interesting way of looking at things, we get so intent on proving that our way is right, that we will run right over whoever we're talking to. We are going to prove to them that we are right, which automatically makes them wrong. And nobody likes to be told they're wrong. And we are trying to fundamentally change who they are as a person. So being judgmental doesn't get you anywhere. First of all, your patient is going to immediately become defensive. And you're trying to take away what makes them special. So people are going to resist that. So we have to be really careful about not being judgmental. And in fact, when I run up against somebody that uh, in a clinical setting that believes something different than I do and clearly wants to talk about it, I will usually say something like, how interesting, I've never heard that, tell me more. Now it can be absolutely 100% against everything I believe, but that's okay, I'm not going to change. It doesn't hurt me at all. I'm secure in my own belief system. It doesn't hurt me at all to listen to what somebody else has to say. Now, this is where critical thinking comes in. Do you guys know what critical thinking is? This is a term that's thrown around a lot in mainstream media, and it's not what most people think it is. Thinking is thinking. Thinking happens in your head. It's what you know, and you can only think about things you know, right? Critical thinking, that term critical is important. Critical actually means against what you know. So when you're critically thinking, that means that you're taking information that is contrary to what you know and evaluating it to see 
is it true? Does it line up with my values? Do my values need to change based on this new information? So when we're critically thinking, we need to make sure, number one, that our knowledge, what we know, right, what we, we already know in our minds, we have to make sure that it is correct and that it um, is defensible in light of this new information. So that's number one. Number two is, is our knowledge from a reputable source? And number three is, is the new information from a reputable source? And then we can figure out, does this new information change what I already know, right? That's critically thinking. So when we are talking with somebody who doesn't share our beliefs or our values, um, we have to either decide we're just gonna use active listening and not really take it in, or we, are, we have to employ critical thinking to figure out whether it should change our current values, right? And this is how we grow as a society, by the way. So um, being non-judgmental is an important part of that whole equation because if I'm so judgmental that I'm not willing to even look at another viewpoint, then I'm not going to be changing as an individual. I'm not going to be have any growth. And um, guys, what you know, a hundred percent of what you know is not is not likely to be completely true, right? So we have to be have a system in place for us to evaluate if what we know is true and should it change in light of new information. So the third thing is to show empathy. Now this is, we go way off the track with this one, guys. So a lot of people do this. They're very empathetic, but they're empathetic in the wrong way. So most people think that showing empathy is to be able to commiserate with a person, to find a common ground. And that's actually not what it is. And I've heard this a lot from caregivers, nurses and doctors and CNAs and a lot of people in healthcare. Let's say that I have cancer right? And you want to show empathy for that. So you will probably search your little mental database, try to find somebody that you know that had cancer and what their life experience was. And you're going to relay that to me because you're trying to make a connection. That's not empathy. That is not empathy. And yet we do it all the time. Oh yeah, my sister-in-law had that type of cancer. Um, it was horrible. She had to go through chemo, radiation, and this and that. That does not help your patient at all. That is not empathy. That is shifting the focus from your patient to you. So showing empathy is actually um, understanding the feelings behind the words. That's what showing empathy is. It's not a shared experience. It's showing, it's understanding the feelings behind the words. So empathy means you have to dig into the feelings. Now, as CNAs, we generally run from that. We don't want to talk about the feelings. We don't want to explore how the patient um, is feeling about that diagnosis or what they're having trouble processing, right? We, we don't want any part of that conversation. So remember that empathy is digging into the feelings behind the words. Now, paraphrase and clarify. Most people just totally skip over this one because it sounds funny, right? And it always reminds me of the military. So in the military, when an order is given, it's always repeated by the recipient along with a acknowledgement. So if somebody on a submarine says, turn to bearing 220, the helmsman will say, turning to bearing 220I, right? They're, they're re repeating what was being said, what the order was, and they're acknowledging that the action is occurring. So paraphrasing and clarifying always reminds me of the military, but it really should be used. Now, we're not going to say, oh, you, you're stating that you feel sad because you're dying, right? That just sounds very odd and, and kind of self-serving, so when we're paraphrasing and clarifying, we have to use a little bit more of our vocabulary. So I might say something like, I understand that um, getting that diagnosis must be very uh, frightening for you, or I understand why that might make you sad. Can you tell me a little bit more about your thought process 
and how you're processing this. So you can paraphrase and clarify and show empathy. Remember, empathy is focusing on the emotions behind the words, right? So we can combine these two to have a better um, way of relating to the patient. And then, of course, we get to that ask open-ended questions. I don't want to say something to that patient like, um, yeah, you know, dying sure does suck. That doesn't help my patient. They're, they're telling me they understand that. You know, they're, they're sad over it. That doesn't help my patient at all. So I would want to ask an open-ended question here. Uh, that, that helps the patient um, focus on processing their own feelings, like um, how long ago uh, did you get your diagnosis and um, how are you processing what's going on? You want to allow them the opportunity to talk in a non-judgmental environment. So um, this is a way bigger uh Active listening is way bigger than the two or three paragraphs you see in a um, textbook somewhere, right? So active listening is actually tested on both the written and the skills part of the exam. Um, it, it's a little bit more indirect than, than you think. They're not going to ask you straight out what is active listening, but they may give you some conversations and ask you what an appropriate response is. So you have to understand those five aspects of active listening to pick the right response, right? But it's also graded on the skills part of the exam as well, particularly on just communicating with the patient. So if you aren't giving the patient your full attention, if you're talking over them, if you're being judgmental, if you're not asking open-ended questions, those things will come through on the skills part of the exam and it will be graded under the communication as well. Um, but remember that the test is important, but it's actually more important that we understand this for our day-to-day -day practice in healthcare, right? for the relationships that we're gonna build with our patients. So how can you improve your own active listening skills? Well, for me, personally, I replayed that conversation that I had a couple of days ago and tried to figure out how I could improve my communication with this person moving forward um, and try to figure out where my faults were in that communication. Now, I'm not gonna tell you I'm the only one at fault right? But I should have had enough awareness to understand that this individual was looking for um, an, a platform, an opportunity to uh, relay their beliefs and their thoughts and things like that. And they weren't looking for an actual conversation. So um, this is kind of hard for me, to be honest with you, because I am a problem solver. That's who I am. That's what I do. You bring me a problem and I'm going to try to solve it for you. I'm not real good at just listening with no action. So this is something that I am still working on. But if we take the time to try to look at all of our past um, conversations and especially the ones that didn't go all that well and try to figure out where we can focus on improving, whether it's full attention or being non-judgmental or employing empathy, focusing on the emotions behind the words, um, paraphrasing and, and uh, clarifying, and of course, asking those open-ended questions. If we can figure out where our shortcomings are, we can devise our own strategies to improve those and make sure our communication attempts moving forward are much more effective for both parties. So I hope that helps you guys. Does that help you guys? Does that help you? All right, so let's see what, uh, what everybody has to say here. Letitia, preparing for a state exam next week. How exciting. Good vibes out to you. We're going to hope that you do fantastic. Go over to our website and um, uh, sign up for the ebook. So it's for, let me type this in for you. So it's foryourcna.com slash ebook. Sign up for our ebook. It's free and it'll help you on the written part of the state exam, okay? 
And uh, Blue says, in the CNA HCA classes I, agency I work for, we added 10 hours to the training program. Not state required, but we cover the small things, the emotional side, such as active listening and diversity. Yes, absolutely, Blue. Absolutely. Cultural language barriers, how to handle family members. Yeah, absolutely. And these are the things that are real world. And this is what's going to de determine the type of relationships that you build with your patients. Um, so all of those topics are super, super important. And I don't think that they have enough um, coverage in mainstream education or in in-service training. So that's why I brought it up. Uh, Renette, first time here. Welcome, welcome. We do this every Thursday at 3. Uh, so let's see here. Nefar says, hi, I'll be starting my CNA class in two weeks. What type of nursing essentials will I need during and after the program? Well, that's a very good question, Nefar, but it really depends on your training uh, center. So some centers require scrubs. Um, others don't. Some training centers will require blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes. Others will have that um, equipment on hand for your use. So that information is best obtained from the training center that you're going to be going to. Find out what kind of equipment that, they're go that you're going to need. Now, as far as patient care equipment, basins and... Um, Emesis basin, wash basin, bedpan, drainage bag, tooth at, toothbrush, gate belt, all of those things. Again, you want to go to your training center to find out, but we actually have a practice kit that you can purchase that has all of that in it, and that may be a help to you too. Go over to my website, hit shop, and look for the practice kit. That may help you when you're going to practice those skills. Uh, Rokio? Rocio says, um, how many skills do they usually give us for the test? Oh, that actually depends on the state that you're in, believe it or not. Every state is structured just a little bit differently. There are several major uh, testing platforms. There's Prometric, there's Credentia, there's HD, uh, or I'm sorry, DNS Headmaster. Um, so there's lots of different uh, types of testing providers, and each one is going to be set up a little bit differently. Um, Prometric is three skills. Headmaster is usually five. There are other um, train in, uh, independent trainers that have, uh, I believe the most I've seen is seven. Um, so you'll have to look at your state standards for that, okay? Uh, Liz says, I've been doing CNA for about six years, but I only got to do my certification in Pennsylvania and the state exam, but not the skill exam part and COVID hit. I was unable to get my license. I'm so sorry to hear that, Liz. I'm so sorry. I do know that they did over the last year allow people that trained and were unable to test during COVID, allow them to test. So I'm so sorry you missed that um, window. And, and in most states, that window is now closed. You would have to go back through a training program. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. But uh, don't give up. Uh, go back through a training program and get certified because, boy, do we need you. All right. Uh, Blue says, not on empathy. Yes, it's possible to be empathetic while not agreeing with yes. Absolutely. You can hate the fact that someone eats nothing but junk food, but you can be empathetic about their dental issues. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, remember that nobody is exactly like you. And when you remember that empathy is the emotion behind the words, right? So let's take your example here, right? We've got somebody who's eating nothing but junk food. And um, as a healthy individual, you find that to be very... Um, concerning, right? You're, it doesn't line up with your value systems. So you find it actually a little bit offensive that they don't think enough about their body to put healthy things in it, right? So you can kind of try to lecture them on the benefits of eating healthy and all that, but you're probably not going to get anywhere, honestly, because they've heard that before. They're, they're not new to the planet. So if somebody is eating nothing but junk food, we have to look beyond the words and the actions and look at the emotions behind that. So why do you think they're eating nothing but junk food? 
Is it to satisfy an emotional need? Is it uh, because of anxiety? Is it just because uh, junk food tastes better, right? So what is the emotional need behind the words? And that's where that empathy comes in. So um, if you kind of remember that empathy is the emotion behind the words. Uh, the classic says, hey, Patty, just wanted to let you know that I got an almost perfect score on my written and clinical state exam. Oh, congratulations. That is amazing. Thank you so much for all your help and knowledge. You're an amazing teacher. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your journey. That's amazing. Amazing. Um, let's see here. Uh, that's good to know how many skills I'm doing it with Prometric. Yes. So for Prometric, you'll get three skills uh, to perform. They're going to be on a care plan. You have to do them in the order listed. You're actually graded on five, three that you know about, hand washing and indirect care. Go over to my uh, website, foryourcna.com, and look at my animated lessons. I actually have one on um, what to expect on the CNA exam, and it'll help you, okay, because it's all about Prometric testing. Uh, Nafar says, what type of careers do most CNAs transition to other than nursing? It's, uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there in healthcare. There's ultrasound, there's uh, CT uh, tech, there's lab uh, assistant, there's phlebotomist, there's medical records. There's a lot of different opportunities in healthcare beyond nursing. Um, so I, it, it's hard for me, I can't really pinpoint anyone, but I can help you with, as a CNA, where you might uh, thrive. So different types of work as a CNA. So if you go to, let me type this in, slash your ideal workplace. This is a quiz I developed to help you just learn about yourself um, what type of CNA work would best suit you. So go take, it's free, it's, it's a personality quiz, go take it, it'll help you. Um, let's see here, can I get the correct answer of the practice question that was given in the link? Um, RN, I'm not real sure which practice question you were talking about. I'm, I'm not sure what link you're talking about. Um, so because I don't know what question, I don't know what to tell you about the answer, but we do have a practice test on our website. Hey guys, uh, stay tuned. I do wanna cover this real quick. We are in the process of a major revamp on our website, and we're gonna have tons of practice tests on there for you, um, for you to be able to access in the next, uh, give me a couple months to get it all done, because it's a lot of content. Um, but we're in the process of a major refresh on our website, so we'll have tons of practice questions. But in the meantime, go like our social media, anywhere on social media. So if you go to any of these, right, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, um, go to any of these, and we post a question of the day. So it has the question, the answer choices, and then the third uh, picture will be the, the correct answer and the rationale. So if you're looking for practice questions, go subscribe to one of my channels and you'll see all of those question of the day. And I think we've been doing that post for like six months now. So there's lots of questions in there that you can um, take a look at that will help you. We also have a free practice test on our website as well. All right, so uh, Ro Rocio, I hope I'm saying that right, Rocio. Um, it says, do I have to take another class or get another type of certification to be a pediatric CNA? That's a good question. It's going to depend on two things, the state laws as well as your employer requirements. So there's a lot of places that you don't need any additional training. They're going to provide anything additional you need on the job. Others will require some sort of formal pediatric training. Because pediatrics, they're not many humans. They're actually kind of more like a different species. Everything is different. Everything is different. So um, every place that you're going to go to work will have a different requirement. So I can't give you any specifics on that. Uh, Fred says, how do I join your CNA class in person? Great question. So we live stream my CNA program 
in YouTube, just like here, every Monday and Wednesday from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Eastern. So if you just come on to here, uh, YouTube, in fact, if you hit the subscribe button right below where I'm at, hit the subscribe button and ring the bell, YouTube will notify you when I go live. So we have we live stream our classroom, I answer questions, just like here, when you're typing in your questions, at the end of my uh, class, I actually answer your questions. So it's just like you were sitting in my classroom. I got multiple cameras, um, we have microphones, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's really good quality for you. So, uh, and that's free. So come join my class, it's a lot of fun. You'll love it, and I guarantee you'll learn something along the way. Uh, Chana says, just wanted to pop up and say hello. Yesterday I passed the CNA test by watching the videos and studying. So thanks so much. Congratulations to you, Chana. Congratulations, that's fantastic news. And thank you for enjoy, uh, including us in your journey. So let's get to that part because we're running out of time today. Um, this is the part I absolutely love where I get to congratulate all the people this week that passed the state exam and stopped by my channel to let me know that, um, that they passed. And if you have a test coming up, let us know so we can give you good vibes. And uh, when you pass, drop by our channel, leave me a comment on any of my videos, but pick a, a, do a fresh comment, not a reply to somebody else. Do a fresh comment, okay? And we'll be happy to congratulate you on an upcoming episode. So congratulations to those today that let us know. Um, let's see here. The Classics and Chana, congratulations to you. We also want to congratulate Cassandra Thompson, Amy Eveline, Celia Harvey. We have a lot today. Uh, Musenji Musamali. S.N., Pauline Francis, LaToya Scott, J. Brim, Erica Smith, Ava, and Carlene Jean. Congratulations to all of you guys. Fantastic job, and welcome to the wonderful world of healthcare. We've got two people that are testing soon, Christine Lee and Ruby. So good vibes out to you. And awaiting results is Marie Gabrielle Lewis and Shanika Newsom. So they have tested and they're just waiting on the results. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed and send good uh, vibes their way that they pass. And hopefully they'll come back and let us know so we can congratulate them on an upcoming episode. Fred, I want to enroll in your class. Well, our uh, the uh, live stream is free for everybody. Just show up on YouTube. You can sit in on the class. If you actually want to come to my classroom session, um, we the next class will start June 12th. We only have one classroom. It's in Spring Hill, Florida. So if you're nearby, feel free to enroll in the class. You can get classroom uh, information on my website for your cna.com. Um, but if you're outside of the Spring Hill, Florida area, you're probably just going to have to watch me on YouTube because I'm only in one place. Um, this is the only place you can find me. Um, so I hope today's lesson helped you guys evaluate your communication techniques and have a little bit better understanding of uh, active listening because it's not what they're, you know, what the textbooks kind of. Um, it's not as dry as what the textbooks tell us. So I hope it helps you guys. Um, remember that I'll be back next week on Thursday at 3 with another lesson for you and more people to congratulate, we hope. And um, we have uh, tune in on Monday and Wednesday this week. We're finishing up a class. Next class will start on June 12th. I do have a couple of uh, week break in between because we are um working on the website. I'm working on a new edition of the book. We've got a lot of things going on. New flashcards are in too. So, so, so exciting about that. So um, those of you that are studying for the state exam, we have brand new flashcards. I just totally redid the flashcards. I'll have the new images up on the site shortly. So you can take a look at those. Um, all right. And the next live practice test game show will be in two weeks. So stay tuned for that. It'll be uh, the first Tuesday of June. So I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Go do something fun. Uh, life isn't all about work. So make sure you're doing something fun as well. Until next time, guys, happy caregiving.